Um, and I suppose like many people here this morning, um, often wear two hats. My main two hats are I'm principal of a brand new school um, that's opened up in Smethwick. That's the Independent Republic of Smethwick, um, just southwest uh, of Birmingham here. Um, and my other role is, is looking after all the primaries in the trust, which at the moment is three, um, but we're soon moving to six. So we've got another three um, technology free schools that are opening in the West Midlands area um, over the next three to four years as well. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague Andy here. Morning. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Andy Collins. I work with Kirsty at Shireland. Um, I've been there for 10 years. Um, my focus is on everything school improvement, largely focused on curriculum and technology. Um, so I'll chime in on the curriculum slides and then we'll talk more about what we're doing in terms of digital learning as we go through. Thank you. I think we're just really excited to be here. So we're half a, just over half a term into the real journey, but the journey started back in 2016 and it was very much when we looked at how we could take Shireland, which had been a secondary school, it had been outstanding for, for over 10 years, um, and do the thing that we really wanted to do, which was to have an all through on the campus. Um, and one of the things that really drove us to this is the children, when they came to us in year seven, had a whole variety of experiences from over 30 different primary schools. And really to hit the ground running in our really unusual curriculum, our Key Stage 3 model, we have about five primary school teachers there. It's almost like a school within a school. Um, they're taught for 19 hours a week by one teacher and then where we have um, specialised subjects where they go in the afternoon. And then that um, changes in year eight to 14 hours a week with a, with a teacher. But it's all underpinned with technology. And one of the things that we found was we were spending a lot of time teaching children the skills that they needed rather than focusing on the curriculum. So that was a real driver for us to, to open up um, a primary school of our own. Um, and then we were approached by the DfE, we were successful with our bid, and it was one of the top scoring bids um, that they'd had for a free school, and they said, will you go and do some more? So um, as we are gluttons for punishment, we said okay, um, little thinking about how long the journey would take us. We were um, to open in 2017, um, but with land issues and a whole host of reasons that I'm really not going to bore you with this morning because the pain, I'm still very much scarred from that, is that we're here um, finally two years later with our school open um, with 90 children um, in there. But really, where did we start with that blank piece of paper? Because a blank piece of paper is incredibly exciting, but my God, it's scary as well. Where do you start? And for us, it was very much about establishing a vision of what we wanted this school to be. We didn't have any legacy, um, resources, staffing. We could really start with our values and where we wanted to be right from the start. We could build the curriculum. We could write our policies. We could go and recruit our staff. It really was a great opportunity, but it was really scary to when you started to sit down and, and put pen to paper. So this is really the nub of where we go to, and this everything we do comes back to this, is about our pupils achieving beyond ours and their expectations. But it isn't about the technology, it's about providing the best technology-enabled opportunities that we are. The technology is just a tool and underpins. So really, it was very much about how we were preparing our pupils for the future world. Now, in my <clears throat> 25 years of being in education, I know you're going to say she doesn't look like she's had 25 years. Trust me, inside, I feel like I've been in education for 25 years. It was very much looking at the primaries that I've worked with over about 170 primaries over those 25 years in various roles, very much feeling as though we were failing the future generation in preparing them. And it isn't just about digital skills, how to code. Oh, it's so much more than that. It's how to use technology for learning. I look at my own daughter, who's now 17. She is the first um, year group that has not had formal training and teaching of ICT. 
She is fabulous in her own personal life in terms of using social media, Instagram, all of that. Can she use Office in terms of helping her with her studies? She just about knows how to have the basics in terms of Word, just about the basics in PowerPoint. And the other day, to my embarrassment, and trust me, I have tried, she asked me what Excel actually did. And we're in a quarter of the way through the 21st century. How are we failing our children in preparing them to help them with their learning, having the digital skills to enable them to go and get the jobs that are changing? Later on, there is a, in the main theatre um, a, a whole session on how the fourth industrial revolution is happening at the moment and how are we actually in schools prepared for the workforce that is changing? Technology is transforming our workforce. Are we preparing our young people to have the skills to do that? Are we preparing them to be safe in that world as well? So, what does a technology school look like? Well, it does not, if you came into our school, you would not see the technology. It isn't about them sitting in rows, doing lots of AI, on the computer and doing. We have our reception in year one and it, is, it looks nothing like that. But it is about, and this is Derin, this is one of our uh, reception pupils, it is about getting them opportunities, particularly in the early years, to explore and experience new technology so they're not frightened or inhibited by it. It is about giving them lots of opportunities to do that, but it isn't about the new sexy piece of technology that's coming out. For us, it's more about fundamental pieces of technology that will systemically change things and children will actually be able to use and use in multi-purpose sorts of ways. It is about them being collaborative learners, whether that's physically or whether that's in a digital space as well. It is about them being smart users of technology, knowing when to use it, but also when not to use it. The pen and paper has its place just as much as an iPad uh, or another piece of tech is. It's just another tool. But how, how are we training them to know when to use it and when not to use it? And it's also about, therefore, not just about our pupils. So for me and for Andy, it's very much about training our staff so that they are smart users of technology as well, so that they are thinking teachers and know when to use, when not to use, when is the best time to be able to accelerate that learning, extend that learning? And it isn't about replacing teachers at all or whatsoever. It is about developing that thinking team. Working at home, we do look at how technology can extend work at home, but it isn't about all of the work at home either. Um, and I think in the immortal words of Hannah Montana, you can have the best of both worlds. And I don't understand why in education we polarise things so much. You know, digital skills versus knowledge. You know, pen versus technology. Why can't we have a school and education system that embraces all of that? And that's what we're trying to do in our school. It is about having the best of both worlds. And I'm not going to sing that one for you. Um, we'll, we'll go on, if we get a chance, we'll talk about the family engagement. We've got 87 children in our school. Um, we've got our online platform. We're using, actually, at this moment in time, we're using Class Dojo. Um, and originally, it was for, uh, we used it for behavior. But it's had, in the um, six weeks that we've actually put it into our school, all 87 families have signed up. Uh, and the as a communication tool and sending work at home, it's absolutely tran transformed our relationship with our families as well. So we opened this year in September with our two classes in reception and one class in year one. And really, the things that underpin, we have technology which I say we either underpins or is the wrapper around the edge, but really our other three pillars is all about curriculum, a good sound curriculum and when we started the journey it was not done for the new Ofsted inspection framework. It was about very much having that breadth, that whole education for our children. Um, 
and good quality teaching. At the end of the day, those are the people, the teachers are going to get the best out of children. But I'm sure I'm not telling you things that you don't already know. So this is what our teachers try and do. They try and create irresistible learning experiences, whether that's through the curriculum or the technology or together. And it is driven by our, our values. And our values um, just so happen, there's Anaya, that he's great. He embodies our school, Anaya, he yeah. really does. Um, excite, explore, uh, and excel. And the reason why they're so important to us, they aren't just strap lines, you think, oh, we've got to have a set of values. They drive what we do because it's supposed to mirror our learning journey. Um, it's about the children being excited to come to school. It's about the staff being excited to come to school. If my staff are excited and want to come to school, I know my children are going to get a great deal. But it is it, are they ready to engage in learning? Because if they're not, they've got a much harder job on their hands trying to get the children to learn. The explore is all the learning part. And we think if we get this right and this right, th this bit should come a lot more easily and we don't need to worry about things. In terms of looking at how technology enables our curriculum, it really is about how technology can be used to engage our pupils and our families, how technology can enable things to happen that you couldn't be able to do before with a curriculum that is offline and isn't in an online world. How does technology enhance what the children are doing? and thinking very carefully about that and, and enhancing, but also extending those learning opportunities back at home. We only have the children for six and a half hours of the school day. How can we get as much as possible out of those home learning opportunities that is more than a piece of paper just going home and being left at the bottom of the book bag and being forgotten about? How can I engage and extend those opportunities so that families want to buy into what they're doing at home. And technology, if it's managed, and I, took, I use the word carefully, managed, or even better, the old Bechter word from many, many years ago, harness our technology really well. That's what we want to try and do. So in terms of the curriculum, um, we, again, well before Ofsted came in, looked at how we could have this smart, connected learning. We all know that learning in discrete subjects sometimes children can't see the connections that you have in the real world and having that where you have that overlay is really important but remembering that you're developing the individual subject skills that children need to know they need to know that they're doing history and geography but it's in the context of the Egyptians or in the context of um, water so our curriculum is very much built in this. And this really was um, about 18 months ago. We looked at what we wanted, all the elements we wanted within our curriculum to be. Um, so we looked at each of our themes, you know, how long they were going to be, how long it would take to be in there. And we said that what we wanted to do as a, as a senior leadership team is build a curriculum that was 75% done but allowed for 25% personalization and contextualization. So that depends in any of our primary schools where the children are in their learning, that particular year group, that particular cohort within the school, or even where the school's located. Um, we then looked at driving question, and, and we'll go into this a little bit more detail. Um, but we looked at how we could have reading going to the heart of what we were doing. So we brought back story time. So we have got um, story time um, profiled in at the end of every day. And that's really with a text where the children, it fits in with our themes that we have. Um, and the children um, progress through that book. There's a love, there are lots more smaller books in, the, in where we go, shorter books in early years and key stage one. But they're moving up to key stage two where they're much, much longer and they really engage with the children and teachers can bring that love of reading back and that excitement back. We've also got our investigation. I know that um, we've got um, um, the, the curriculum that we looked at in terms of investigating, um, story escape um, and our love to write as well and all of those are very much built into the curriculum. Um, 
We also looked at the cultural capital, which have become buzzwords at the moment, but I suppose we didn't realize it was cultural capital at the, at the time. But looking at how our children, when they leave, really have that love of music or art, that they know that Van Gogh um, painted sunflowers, that they leave knowing that Stravinsky wrote a piece of work called The Rite of Spring um, and is part of our, uh, their dinosaur um, theme that they're studying uh, in year one. Um, that they are able to recite some poetry. There's some value to that because those are the things that the children will remember and learn. They're certainly the things I remember and learn when I think back to um, my childhood and my school. Um, and even things like classic films, things like the railway children, things that will last um, and go through. We also have um, a family learning project um, that is with every theme. Um, and we also look at flip learning and how we can really um, take traditional homework and make it more purposeful and have a higher take up of engagement with families and pupils as well. In terms of how a theme are uh, constructed, we'll, we'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. So really it was the tension of, in, in terms of the theme, if we power the excitement, how do we look at the drivers um, of our curriculum? So every theme has a driving question and that really looks at um, how things are connected to outside of a theme. So if they are looking at um, a particular topic where they're looking at growth and perhaps looking at plants um, and the end outcome is to produce um, a fruit salad, um, it's how the express, the outcome, is the excitement of producing that fruit salad at the end of the theme but actually we're connecting the learning, the driving question is about which vegetable, which fruit, pieces of fruit come from and grow in the best conditions. And we have a little way, uh, experiment and science investigation that runs alongside that. So it really is looking at the why we are learning things, but also looking at how we motivate and excite the children as well. Here are just some examples of our excites that we do within the theme. Um, we did our... Um, Last week, I'll just have a look and see at how we created our excitement when dinosaurs came to visit our school. That we posted on Class Dojo for families to, to, to look at and see. Um, and that really is grasping the, the excitement of the children um, and getting their attention and, and getting their buy-in. In terms of then going from that excite, how we then look at the explores, and this is, the, I suppose, the success, where the success will lie, is looking very much at how we structure that sequence of learning. So the excites are great, and I know that the teachers get really um, competitive about how they can do that part of the theme, but the most important part, really, is then looking at that structured part of learning and making sure that we sequence them correctly to get what we want, where we want to be in terms of the end outcomes. Our excels are our assessments. So we look at our writing assessment, we look at key thematic outcomes, and we also look at science outcomes as well. And we also have low stakes quizzing. We don't see there's a problem with low stakes quizzing, just to assess their subject knowledge. And then we move on to our moderation and exemplification bank. So we've got that that runs aside. So teachers and pupils have got something to aim their writing about. In terms of reducing workload, what we have done is look very much at um, that sequence and capturing it, but allowing for that 25%. So in terms of the medium term planning, we've done that for the teachers. And the teachers then what they do is, I suppose, do that contextualization, that 25%. Um, and that then, that personalization and that planning attention um, creates what we call a theme plan. And that's something that can be carried forward to the next year where the teachers pick that up and can then just work on that as well. So I'm going to hand over to Andy now who's going to talk about our digital framework and how we've put this alongside the curriculum. Thank you. So um, I suppose just to outline this, some of these things that we're talking about isn't just in terms of what we're doing in primary, but also in secondary. So things like driving questions we've been using for in uh, Literacy for Life curriculum for the last 12 years. 
Um, and so lots of the approaches that we're talking about, although in a primary context, we're also doing and looking at in terms of secondary. Um, but what we've produced is uh, what we're calling our digital learner framework. And we've outlined three broad areas um, for technology. I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, which are these. Uh, so we've sort of outlined digital literacy, digital citizenship, and then technological skills. Um, the National Curriculum Programme Study for Computing focuses really heavily in, in this area, but doesn't account for much of what's going on in the other two. So just going back to here, what's, what's this for? So it sets out how we're going to use technology across our primary, um, both from uh, uh, teaching and learning as part of the curriculum, but then for the wider use of technology. Uh, sets out expectations, so within this, um, and as I go through, every single step within here um, has an expectation for what this looks like in EYFS in Key Stage 1, uh, Lower Key Stage 2 and Upper Key Stage 2. And now the body of work that we're doing is looking at how this translates into secondary. And so we're already moving this into Key Stage 3, as Kirsty referenced earlier. Um, at the secondaries, we, we get kids from 30, 40 different primary schools, all that will have different experiences of using technology. Um, and what we're trying to do through the work that we're doing with the technology primaries is make sure that kids come to us discerning users of technology, able to pick up a device and pick the right piece of software, the right tool to perform a specific task. And so for digital literacy skills, that's broken down into five areas. Um, and within these, we break them down to what does that look like at a planning stage? What skills are required? How does that look like from an evaluation perspective? What are we expecting kids to do at each of these stages? And so things like communication and collaboration and critical thinking. Uh, digital researching and, and information literacy, understanding. By the time these kids are, are in year five, year six, they should be looking at sources of information and looking for things like bias and understanding who the author is and why they might have a specific pers perspective on things. And this framework that we put together is there for teachers to use as a guide for what should I be expecting the children in my class to be able to do at this point. Technological skills, broken down to more than just programming and, and thinking about algorithms. Uh, so things like what does, what does good animation look like in year three? What about data handling or, and programming's in there or publishing? And our teachers go to our digital framework and take, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm planning on doing something around, I don't know, monkey puzzle in year one. How can I turn that into an animation? What sort of things can I expect my year one children to be accessing? How do I make sure that when these kids are in year four, year five, that they've got the foundations in animation based on what I've been doing in, in year one or year two? And then digital citizenship, breaking down around online safety and, and cyberbullying health and well-being and thinking, having conversations with kids about screen time. What's an appropriate conversation to be having with a, an eight-year-old about screen time? Well, that's what our framework tries to, to set out. Um, digital identity and footprint. Not so much a big issue in primary, but we certainly see it from the secondary side where kids are on social media not really thinking about what they're posting. And we have examples of kids that have done something silly on social media that has then gone on to affect what they're able to do. So it's priming our, our primary school kids with this information so that when they go into secondary and they're on social media and they're actively on social media, they've got a bit of a background in, in digital identity and footprint. And then rights and ownership. And then it's, it's not just about the progression of the skills within there. There's lots of subtle progression through our framework where in EYFS, the technology use is, is experiential um, and then moving into to learning and using and then by upper key stage two, there's a fluency. Um, whether it's I'm looking at what I'm doing and it's just for me, whether it's I'm working with a, a, a wider group of people, whether it's I'm doing something as a school project or, or even outside of school. I mean, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the one here is in, in EYFS where kids are beginning to use technology they're experiencing a lot. In Key Stage 1, we're increasing that and we're, we're putting these opportunities through our curriculum for teachers to, to choose to use or to choose to create their own. Regularly using technology for a range of different purposes by the time they're in Lower Key Stage 2 
And then in upper key stage two, children are making judgments about what's appropriate to use. So if I'm given a task, they can say, well, I'm going to use a laptop and PowerPoint, or I'm going to use an iPad and this app. And they're making those decisions. They're being discerning. They're, they're picking what's the most appropriate tool for the job. And that seems to want to do that. And as I was saying, so all the stuff that we're doing with our curriculum and the digital framework are, are now meshing together. So the, the digital opportunities sit into our curriculum planning, into the, the medium term plan. And our teachers will then go through and say, well, I, I'm definitely going to do this one. And I'm going to make sure I've done this and I've done this. Um, and they'll come up with some of their own ideas and they'll add those in. Um, but it's about having the, the opportunities available. And what this framework is, is enabling our teachers to do is, is to pitch things confidently at the right level. Okay, that's fine. And um, hopefully, when it's built and finished in the summer, that is what, going to, what it's going to look like. So um, as we grow next year, um, and we take on our nursery and we grow into year two. By 2024, we'll have our first year six. Um, and it has been an incredible journey. It's been a great journey till now, um, and it will be going forwards. If you ever get a chance to open a school from scratch, run away completely. No, I mean, go for it, absolutely, because it's been an absolute hoot. And we're just about getting to the point where we, we're, we're really happy with it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that's been useful. Thank you. Thank you.